Welcome, viewers, and thank you for joining us for the third installment of a four-part series entitled Future Proofing the Graduate Professional. A special word of welcome to our members and to our intermediaries. PPS is all about the largest mutual insurer in South Africa, and we exist solely to serve our professional members who, unlike the clients of other insurers, are actually owners of our business. And of course, they share in our profits. My name is Marlon Goss, and I am head of PPS Specialist Support Services, which provides technical advice and financial planning support to our intermediaries and of course our members. The session today is entitled Holistic Financial Planning for Professionals. We'll be kicking off by exploring the concept of wellness and what that means in the context of a busy professional. We will identify the various planning areas of a holistic financial plan and how this changes over time. Importantly, we will also spend quite a bit of time on the importance of a will and the critical role played by state planning in a financial plan. So our session today is scheduled for an hour. We'll use the first 40 minutes to get through the content, and thereafter we'll open the floor to questions. Now please note that all microphones, other than those of the co-presenters, have been switched off. You may use the chat function for all your questions. Please feel free to fire them off at any time during the session. But please do note that we'll only address them during the allocated slot. So for this particular installment, we've introduced a new function to the webinar. So members, if you would just please have a look on the, on the right hand side of your control panel, you'll find that there's an icon called files. By clicking on that particular icon, you will then be, be enabled to download the files. You can, you can actually do that right now. Just click the share button, hover your cursor over it, click the share button, and of course, um, you'll get access to today's presentation. So of course, as, as, as normal, uh, we'd like to keep the session quite lively. Uh, to assist us in doing so, we'll be firing off a number of different polls, three polls uh, to be exact. So please participate. And then I think, I mean, lastly, we're also running a, a special offer. Um, so please be on the lookout for that. But more on that later. So joining me, I have two guests today, actually. I see one, one has actually fallen off. In the background, uh, we've got our technical staff, our IT staff that is trying to get uh, Annika Leroux uh, back online. But I think in the interim, Vainant, will you please be so kind to, as to introduce yourselves to, to our viewers? Yes, Marlon, thank you so much. My name is Vainant Priya. I am a certified financial planner professional at PPS. I've worked with PPS or at PPS for the last three years, and I've got nine years worth of financial planning experience. Uh, I am the regional manager for the inland team for specialist support services, and I'm very excited to be here today. This is something that I'm very passionate about, so thank you to you and for Malin and God, Mail and Guardian for having me here today. That's fantastic. Thanks, thanks, Wayland. And I see Annika is, is is still down. So I think for the benefit of our of our viewers, um, Annika Leroux is an advocate. She works for PPS Fiduciary Services. She's highly skilled, and she has roughly with thirty years relevant experience in estate administration, wills, and estate planning. So we have quite a bit of content to get through today. So um, if, for the sake of time, I'm going to suggest we get right to it. Now, viewers, um, at PPS, we know that our members are real people, that uh, your lives are rich and multifaceted, and that you have a multitude of often competing needs and demands. Isn't that true, Wayland? 
Yes, Marlon, and when we think about holistic financial planning, we are not just saying it's the different aspects of financial planning that we can look at, which, will, which we also will do today. But it is to say that if you look at somebody as a person, we are human beings. And it's not just about our finances. It's not just about how much money we have or how much income we earn. We're saying that we are also social beings. We are spiritual beings. We are people who care about our profession and we've got emotions. And for us to be a holistic person, to be a truly happy person, we need to have all of these elements in our life in balance. And it is therefore very important when we're doing financial planning to have a look also at all of these aspects and not just at the financial side of that. No, I agree, Vena. You know, uh, viewers, I'm, I'm just looking at this wheel and it's, and it's busy. It's very busy. But I think it's important that we acknowledge that our members live within many different constructs and that any planning that we do absolutely has to ensure congruence with those constructs. Now, Vena, with all this complexity, I mean, what do you recommend should be the starting point of a well-constructed financial plan? Yes, Marlon, we get this question often that clients will ask us, where do we start? How do I make sense of all these things that's happening in my life? And there's one very obvious starting point, your, and that is your budget. Your budget forms the foundation of any good financial plan and for you to eventually have financial freedom. Every single book that I've read on this topic, and it's been a lot, all of them say that the budget is the most important part of your financial planning. And what is the main goal of a budget? Main goal of a budget is actually quite simple, and that is to spend less than what you bring in, because anything else will be unsustainable in the long term. I remember when we were students, we had this Addy where we said there was too much month at the end of our money, because we didn't have budgets and we were just splashing what we've got, and that's still a reality for a lot of people. If you want to take control of your life and of your finances, start with the budget. That's the most important thing that I can tell you today. This is also saying to say, uh, what's the difference between people remaining poor or becoming rich? Well, it's simple. Rich people invest and then they spend what is left of their income. Poor people spend and then try and invest what is left. So it, irrespective of your, the size of your income, that principle should always remain true. Another thing that's very important is, is that a budget should be on paper or on an Excel spreadsheet. And we've got an example there in the background to show on the slide to say this is how a typical budget should look. I often get the clients tell me, no, I've got a budget, but it's here in my head. A budget in your head is not a budget. It is only an idea. So make sure that you write it down so you can see what is happening. And then also this last point is very important is to track your budget. It will help little if you've got a budget and you know how much you have and you know how much you want to spend on certain items, but you don't track that. You'll often be surprised at how much you are spending on certain line items. And the golden rule is, if you run out of money on a light item, just stop spending. So Marlon, this is, if you forget everything I tell you today, this is the most important part of financial planning. Make sure you get a budget, you track it, and that you stick to your budget. Now, when it, I must agree, I mean, that, that the budget is, for all intents and purposes, it is the foundation of your, of your financial plan. And it should be the, the, the starting point or point of departure uh, for it. So I think uh, the budget, informs the financial planner of not only the members' consumption patterns and, of course, areas where, if need be, we can cut back, but importantly, what it costs to maintain that member's standard of life or lifestyle, at least. And, of course, all of this is critical when we start setting goals for risk or retirement or investment or whatever the case may be. Um, now, Annika, I see you back. Uh, I, I apologize on your behalf. I explained to our viewers that you just popped that quickly for a cup of coffee. I'll be back shortly. <laughs> I also took the liberty of explaining or positioning who you are and how you, 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 you fit in at PPS. So I'm sure you, you'll agree that budgeting is critical uh, uh, for successful financial planning. Yes, Marlon. Um, um, sorry. It, it, yeah. No, it's, fine. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably like a good starting point, but I think equally important is the drafting of your will. I mean, it, it's, it's your voice when you're no longer there. And it, you know, this, tell us why this document is so important and what are some of the dangers of the off-the-shelf type wills that are available? 
Thank you, Marlon. I must say I was just in the cloud and was very cold up there, but I'm happy to be back. Um, and indeed, a will is very important. It provides for peace of mind to a person in terms of succession planning. Remember that the will is the last document that speaks on your behalf when you cannot. Sadly, and you can see on the screen that only 14% of people do have a valid will. A lot of people not using their freedom to draft a will. The freedom of testation allows us um, to draft a will and to decide who will inherit and how you want your wealth to be distributed. You know, Marlon, some countries have got limitations in the freedom of testation, and that is called forced airship. In those countries, there's a specific rule that applies who will inherit. In South Africa, you can draft your own will according to your own wishes, appoint your own beneficiaries, create options to protect your loved ones. You can appoint your own executors and trustees who will manage your affairs of those of your loved ones when you are not there to do it yourself. You know, besides this freedom, it allows you to plan for uncertainty and make the what ifs into more clarity and certainty uniquely to you so that you can leave a legacy behind. It is important to note that um, any person can draft a will. Our law allows that you must be 16 years and older and mentally capable of appreciating the nature and the effect of the act. But the drafting of the will is one side. It is also making sure that your will is correctly signed to be executable. So in the COVID-19, we've learned lessons about that um, you need to sign your will electronic. Uh, you sign your will originally. You can't sell sign your will electronically. So it's very important when you sign your will, it must be originally signed in front of two competent witnesses. Those witnesses must be 14 years and older, and they must be competent to give evidence in court. And remember to properly date your will. Um, after you signed the will. So Marlon, the question is, what happens with this 86% of people that does not have a valid will? If you do not have a valid will, interstate succession applies. So that's a legal set of rules. But I think more important is you don't have a say in who will inherit from you. A minor children's inheritance might be held at the Guardian's Fund at the Master of the High Court, which is something we totally want to avoid. So, to avoid forced selling of assets and other problems, it's better to have a valid will drafted. Just to leave the members and the listeners with five uh, very important um, thoughts when drafting the will, of course, besides who you want to inherit. Um, the first thought is when, as I said, when there's minor children, how do we protect this minor children's inheritance? And you can normally do that through testamentary trust, and we will explain inter vivos trust in a moment. The second um, important point is to appoint guardians. If you are the legal guardian and you're not there anymore, who will look after your children? The third point is the protection of beneficiaries, other financial dependents, like your spouse, or even your mother-in-law or children against their own spouses and insolvency if there is a possible chance of a person being insolvent. And I think one of the more important parts is how liquid is your estate? Mm. Remember that your estate needs to cater for liabilities and your legal obligations and contractual agreements before distribution can take place. So on top of that, remember also that death causes your loved one's income to disappear, and we need to cater for that. And I think the last um, or point number five that is important is who do I entrust and appoint to be my executor or my trustee to manage the fees of my estate and my trust when I'm not there anymore? Another question I think that I want to end off with, if you do have a valid will, how often do we have to revise this will? How often is it needed to, to look at your will? And my opinion in terms of a revision of a will is every life-changing event causes you to re-look at your will. If you do get married, if you do have children, 
Um, if you're buying or selling assets, if you get divorced, if you're going on retirement, every life stage, you can really look at your will. And I think Vainant is going to talk about the life stages now, which you will certainly see where does the will fit into this process. Okay, th thanks for that, um, Annika. And members, Annika alluded to earlier about you know, some of the problems that we experienced with the signing of wills during, um, you know, during the lockdown restrictions. So the good news is we are about to go into level three, and at TPS we've made provision in all of our big regional offices where we have specially prepared rooms where, if needs be, for circumstances such as signing a will, that you'll be able to. Where, of course, all social distancing protocols will be observed. So now if you'll just quickly join me and have a look at the right of your screen once again. We all have launched our special offer. Please go to the icon entitled Office. And this offer is in particular is, is, is aimed at those of you within our audience and not just in our audience today, but we may even have viewers that are watching live from YouTube right now who do not have a valid will. Please make use of it for the remainder of May, and then, of course, up until the end of June, PPS uh, Fiduciary Services will be offering world drafting services to our professional clients for free. Now, Annika, statistically, you spoke about liquidity. So when we talk about liquidity, we talk about the ability to give effect to the wishes of the testator or the testatrix, meaning do you have sufficient cash in your estate to wind it up? So tell us statistically, on average, how, what is the percentage of estates that you wind up that do not have sufficient cash or liquidity inside of them? Thank you, Marlon. Indeed, a very good question. Um, out of the 14% of people that does have a valid will, it is sad to say that approximately 65% of those people do not have sufficient liquidity in their estates to wind up those estates. Indeed, very bad statistics. That is a scary statistic indeed. So, uh, members, whilst you're busy, those of you that are busy um, completing the, the form that we need, to take up our special offer, we also about to launch our first poll, and I think this is a, a critical one. It's very important. So the, uh, the very first poll reads as follows: I have a valid will, which is both legally and financially executable. Important, both of them. Your options are: A. Yes, I'm sorted. B. I'm not sure. Alternatively, C. I don't have a will, and I need to speak to someone. So, so please, uh, viewers, please have a look at that poll right now, and please participate. So, I think the other, the other, the the other worrying con uh, statistic is that only fourteen percent of South Africans have a valid will. So, what that means is that the other eighty-six percent will die in test state. This means that there's a set of rules, and that the state, in particular will make decisions on your behalf. So people could inherit who you don't necessarily want to inherit. Um, Annika, at this point, um, when should we actually consider having a world drafted? At what point in our lives? Marlon, yes, as I said, um, the law provides that you need to be 16 years and older to draft a will and be mentally capable of appreciating the nature and the effect of drafting that will. But as soon as you acquire assets, you have a voice in terms of your will to say who must inherit. So important, once you start having assets, you have to have a will to, to, to provide who will inherit that. Okay. Um... Yeah, it, you know, members, I think our, 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 our lives and indeed our personal economies are in a state of constant flux. I remember my wife and I starting out, and, you know, when we bought our first home. And uh, probably because of what I do for a living, we really earn on the side of caution. So, I mean, we bought well within our means. This meant, of course, that in the early days, we were loaded. I mean, we were sitting plush. All of that changed, and it changed aggressively with the birth of our firstborn. So, I mean, there's an old saying that, you know, for all things, there's a season, and I think your cash flow is no different. 
Now, if you're turning to you, is a financial plan or is financial planning a one size fits all? Or is it a bit more complex and dynamic than that? Marlon, it's an extremely dynamic process and it's something that happens throughout our lives. And I hear sometimes that people think financial planning is something you do and now I've got this plan and I can just go and execute on that. It's not the case. You need to review your financial plan once a year. And to illustrate this point of how dynamic financial planning can be throughout your life, what we have done is, is we've said let's break our lives up into what we see typically with our students and go through four different life stages. Now, I just want to say when we go through these life stages and say there's different things that's important at that point, it doesn't mean that it's not important at other points. So if we, for instance, say later mm -hmm. in your life, retirement planning becomes very important, doesn't mean that you shouldn't start saving earlier. What we're trying to illustrate here is to your point to say what is the different dynamics as we go through life to illustrate how important it is to make sure that you do financial planning and all of them. Now, the first one is an exciting time. It was a great time in my life when I was a student. I mean, I had a lot, a lot higher disposable income than I have now. We were eating out so much that people at one of the fast food joints even knew me and my brother on our names. And this is a point where you're a little bit carefree. What do we do for people in the States? People who have student debt, who are dependent still on their families, but they want to get a degree and make a positive impact in the world. Typically, we will help them with the budget. And something very important here is financial education. I wish, Marlon, that I can go back to myself at that stage and say, just eat out once, one fewer time in a week and save that money. And then I would have had a much bigger deposit to put down on my bond. And also we help them to obviously manage their student debt. Then that naturally evolves into this next life stage, mm. where you, where you, what we call your young professional, typically between the ages of 26 and 40, where you're starting to earn some good money and hopefully progressing in your career and where you want to buy those under goals are very important buy your first property and like where we and my wife is now you want to start a family and have children which is quite expensive typically planning for a client in this last stage will start with risk protection and insurance this is very important because this is where we have a look and plan for life insurance that will give cash to your estate so to make sure there's sufficient liquidity to Annika's point make sure there's enough for your ears to live from it looks at disability cover, looks at critical illness cover, and at your income protection. This is sometimes neglected. And I know, Marlon, you've got a nice example that you can use here under income protection. Yeah, absolutely, Vainat. And I think uh, quickly, just before we, we go there, I'm just having a look at the result of our polls. And overwhelmingly, the good news is that that 16% that Annika quoted, um, at least the 86%, doesn't really live here. 73% of our viewers are saying, yes, they are sorted. That's fantastic. I think the worrying uh, the rules for concern is options B and C, where they, we're finding that 5% of our viewers are saying they're not sure. And, of course, the remaining 20% are saying they do not have a will and they need to speak to someone. Of course, the good news is that, that they, we, we are running this special offer. So, of course, we can fix that all still this week, this month. So, I think, you know, finally, we spoke about risk protection and i think the importance of risk protection can't really be overstated i, I remember we had a sales tactic um, you know when i just got into the industry my first sales manager used to teach and it went on about having this machine which daily printed crisp 100 rand notes day in day out that's all the machine would do it would print crisp 100 rand notes and at the end of the story came the question uh, as to whether or not if you had such a machine, whether you would insure it. And of course, everybody who the story was told to overwhelmingly would say, yes, I would insure it. Now, the truth is, that machine is you and it's me. We invest heavily into our professions. We hone our craft over years, over decades. So protecting our ability to generate income and um, protecting our family and the state should be paramount in any plan. You know, it just makes sense. Uh, I think you take, you take the risk and, of course, you transfer it to an insurance company. Yes, and Marlon, I remember to that point, a previous employer when I worked, when they trained us on this, also the trainer went around the room and asked everybody to say what is their biggest asset. And then some said my share portfolio, some said my house. And he said, no, it's actually your ability to mm -hmm. earn an income. If you capitalize that over a period of time, there's no asset that will give you that sort of income. Therefore, it's very important to ensure that. 
So still with the young professionals, this is a place where we will typically make sure there's a will in place, that there's a testamentary trust to, to look after the children. We help these people to save. Emergency funds are very important here, to save between three and six months worth of expenses in a money market or a cash type of instrument, to start saving for specific goals like going overseas or whatever you want to do, and to start saving for the longer term, hopefully to one day supplement your retirement. Then we do something that's very important, that is debt management. And we can do a whole session on debt management. So I just want to leave you with this thought. The, this is the typical time in your life where you have to start making debt, but stay away from what we call bad debt. That is credit cards and retail loan accounts, short-term loans, stuff that you don't have the cash to buy. One of my previous bosses always said, if you don't have the cash to buy it, you don't have the money to buy it and you can't afford it. So it is simple, stay away from that. We help people to understand good debt. A good debt is typically something like a bond on your house, a house that will well, hopefully appreciate in value over time and that you can pay off. A word of caution here, even if you think you're making good debt, but you are overextending yourself, you will not reap the fruits of that. So make sure that when you are making debt, that you are not overextending yourself and that you make it well within your means. Fine, let me just come in here quickly. So, so if you always leave, um, I agree totally on the on on the on the the debt principle. Um, and with that said, one of the things that we often cover uh, debt with is risk cover. So we've launched our second poll, and I can see you guys are active. You guys are are involved, and the second poll is around risk cover. And what we want to know um, is around risk cover and whether or not it actually reflects your income generating potential. So the question reads, my risk cover reflects my income generating pro, uh, potential. Uh, of course, you have three options. The first of which is, yes, I'm adequately protected. And my family too. Option B is I'm not sure. Option C, and uh, this is another scary one. Uh, this one goes on to say my family will be in trouble financially if I die. And worse still, if I am alive and I lose my ability to generate income. So the standings quickly, the good news is 55, 58% of our viewers are good. 23% are not sure. And 18% of our viewers down to 16 are saying that they have real concern. Their families will be in trouble and worse still if uh, the insured event occurs whilst they are still alive. So, Vainant, you know, we've journeyed now through the professional life stages of being a student. We've moved on to uh, what, we, what we've what we termed a young professional. Tell us about the next stage. I can only assume what comes next is possibly a husband, a wife, children. Yes, so uh, obviously that could happen in the previous life stage as well. And... Just to that point, that is something, uh, finding a husband and wife is not something that PPA sort of financial advisor can usually help you with, but they can help you to make sure that all your other things are in place. So, Mon, and then we naturally go over into what we call uh, established professional. Typically people who's between the ages of 41 and 70. These are people who's got dependents, who's got people that is actually dependent on them, and it might, it's usually their children, or might even be their parents. The potential needs that we look at here is in uh, if we look down there at the screen it is uh, a model maybe you can just move us to the other side so we can see there but over there what is very important here is education planning so whether it is for in for university or for schools investment plan investment planning here becomes complex because here we say we need to now make sure that your investments are structured correct correctly the underlying asset allocation is correct you are structured tax efficiently and that you've got enough exposure to growth assets. And then also retirement planning becomes important here because now we can start seeing the end goal. We've got the end goal now that is on the horizon. So we can put a peg in the ground and say, this is how much income I want and how much is it that I have to save and in what funds do I need to save them? Then there's something that's very, very important in this life stage that is so often overlooked. And I see many people who's done proper financial planning and then this next aspect of business planning is being overlooked. So what is business planning without going into the technical details thereof? Let me just give you an example. This is where you plan what happens to your business when you pass away. I'll use one example of a buy and sell agreement of let's say two radiologists. If one passes away, what will now happen to that asset that you've built up? And often when we ask people what happens, they don't know or they're unsure or I mean, they haven't even thought about that. The sad part about that is, is you've now built up 
this asset, which is sometimes a big asset, with your blood, sweat, and tears. And then if you pass away, you do not know if your family will benefit. What business planning then does is it puts a contract in place for you to determine what the value of that shares will be when I pass away now. And it also puts life insurance in place so that you can know for a fact there is sufficient liquidity for your partner to pay it out. So Marlon, just imagine you've gone your whole life and you've built up this business and, and you've put your life into that. And you want your family to benefit from that when you pass away. And your partner comes and they, they buy it um, at least their market value because they don't have the cash or there was no contract in place. So business planning at this stage uh, for, the, for the established professional becomes very, very important. Absolutely. So members, we, um, we're just about to close our second poll and launch our third. And I'm just looking at the standing site, man. I think the good news is about 60% of our, our viewers or the people in the audience are saying, yes, they are adequately protected, their family as well. Uh, 25%, 24% are not sure, and the remaining 14% are saying that my family will be in trouble financially if I die and we're still, if I'm alive and I lose my ability to, den- to generate income. Now, um, I'm about to launch, we, we're ending the, the, the second po- poll, and we're about to launch the next one. And, of course, the next one eludes or speaks to something that you mentioned earlier, Bainat, and that is, of course, around retirement planning. So the question reads as follows. I've been saving enough to really enjoy my golden years. Now, your option here is, yes, I am, or I have saved enough to live my best life at retirement. Option B is, once again, you're not sure. And then, of course, option C, uh, which is probably true for the greater majority of South Africans. Retirement worries me, and I need help. Now, um, you know, Vainan, Business assurance, once again, is, is, is simple risk transfer. I think the difference here is that it protects the business and its owners from the financial impact of death, disability, or ill health. It also ensures that there is a succession plan in place that is executable. It brings business continuity or it creates the business continuity that is needed in the event of the loss of an owner. I think critically, it provides the cash injection needed to buy the business interest of the deceased owner at a fair price. Now, one could look at it as a type of business world. Now, of course, succession planning is not only important in a business context. Um, It's important in a personal as well. So, in fact, there's, there's many factors that occur or happen inside of your personal life, such as uh, your marital regime, uh, debt, divorce, etc., all of which can impact your business and vice versa. So I think the two can't be viewed in isolation. Actually, they inform each other. Would you agree, Annika? Yes, Marlon, I totally agree that they are very much integrated. We view financial planning um, that it involves looking at a client's financial picture and advising them of how to achieve the the long-term and the short-term goals. When we look at the estate planning portion, we look at how do we arrange for a person to die successfully. Now, there's a lot of things that we need to consider, but I just want to turn to the next slide where I give you a brief overview of the cost involved in terms of an estate. So in this slide, um, we're talking about a client with approximately value of five million. And we can easily say that the cost with regards to executive fees, bond cancellation or conveyancing fees can add up almost above four percent of the value of your estate. That taking into account the liabilities that needs to be settled, the um, the contractual agreements according to accrual claims that needs to be catered for, and you can add to that life insurance. So on this slide, it's just a picture to say to you, even if there is life insurance, and in this case, approximately 5.5 million, We must remember to also look at the estate dutable part of life insurance and how does that affect on the planning of your estate. Luckily for us, we do have financial advisors and brokers that assist our clients in these calculations. It's very important and as I see by the poll that we need to 
get in contact with a financial advisor to assist with that liquidity calculator. So another topic I think very important, one of the estate planning tools and the question that we often get asked about is what is the difference between an uh, inter vivos trust and a testamentary trust? So previously I did explain a testamentary trust as a trust being created in terms of the will and only comes into existence once a person has passed on. A living trust or an inter vivos trust, however, is created in your lifetime and immediately come into effect and it's created by the founder who then chooses who will be his trustees and his income and capital beneficiaries. Um, so I'm just going to give you approximately four advantages of still having an inter vivos trust and one of them is asset protection. Assets are not owned by the beneficiaries once they have been transferred to this trust. So while you can enjoy the use and the fruits of these assets, they do not form part of your estate. This means that an asset, um, what was transferred to a trust when the founder thereof was solvent, creditors also cannot make claim on these assets. Second one is estate freezing, and that can be used to minimize estate duty when assets um, who's got the potential of to increase in value or can or can be transferred to a trust. No estate duty is payable on assets owned by the trust as the assets then belongs to the trust and not to the deceased. So it's a really, it's a savings tool that you can have. Um, the effective control of these assets is a perfect tool to avoid the misuse of assets by people who are not able to manage the assets effectively. Of course, this includes minors um, or people who are not being able to look after their own affairs. And the last, um, but not uh, the only one, is perpetual succession, which means the death of a beneficiary doesn't impact the existence of the trust. And the remaining beneficiaries will be able to continue to enjoy the assets in the trust. So there is succession um, going on. I think my last two points in terms of estate planning, and Vainan did talk about uh, business assurance and business entities. A point that I just want to put on the table is that if you're a shareholder of a company or a member of a closed corporation or have a sole proprietor or a public incorporation company, death or disability must also impact in the individual's estate and estate planning. While we normally, as Marlon referred to, um, referred to the business buy and sell agreement as the business will, there are many other factors that we also need to take into consideration in terms of estate planning, like your key man insurance and how to cover your debit and credit loans and surety agreements. And just lastly, um, to talk about retirement planning and um, Section 37C of the Pension Fund Act. We know that um, retirement planning, as I said, everything is part of holistic planning. But remember that when you have your retirement annuities, pension fund, preservation funds, um, in the event of death, the board of trustees make a decision on the payment of the pension provident and RAs. And these are normally guided by your nomination of the deceased person. And it might also take into consideration um, the provisions in terms of the will. But as important, the law provides that um, before payout will happen, um, the Board of Trustees needs to look at who are your legal and your factual dependencies. Your legal dependencies being your, uh, your spouses and your children and factual dependencies, any other person that you financially do support. So Marlon, you can see from these a few points that I've mentioned, how important it is to do holistic financial planning and make sure that you speak to a financial advisor um, in terms to assist you with this planning. Uh, I think I, I must agree. I think, you know, one of the often overlooked aspects of, of uh, retirement funds, you know, your orders or pension funds, whatever the case may be, illness in particular investment like life derivatives, is the value that they can create if they are used properly to effectively reduce estate duty. I mean, up until this point, uh, uh, retirement funds are still not estate duty more. So, you know, members, I think, you know, dying is not for free. It costs money and it costs 
a lot of money, big money. And it's not just in the form of uh, burial expenses, but I think the manner in which your estate evolves also has a very big impact. So, viewers, it's critical that you ask your financial advisor or your broker to conduct what we call a liquidity analysis on your estate. They will need a copy of your will in order to do so. The analysis will test the financial executability of your wishes at death. And I mean, without this test and without ensuring that you've got sufficient liquid capital um, in your estate uh, when it's wound up, your will is reduced to nothing more than a few scribblings on a piece of paper. So legacy and estate planning is important. And I think even more so uh, for the next stage, or at least the last stage that we're going to be covering today, Bainan. Yes, Mom, and so the last uh, life stage that we're going to be covering is what we call the retired professional. So this is now that nice part of life where we all want to get to, where you saved up and you can start living off of your assets and just, just enjoy life a little bit more. If I can give you one tip, I would say postpone this as long as you can or even have a little bit of an income, it makes a big difference when we're doing post-retirement planning. Now, what do we typically do for a client who is a retired professional? At retirement, there's two very important decisions that you have to make. First of all, in what product will I invest my pension? Should I buy a traditional annuity or should I put the money in, in a living annuity? Then very important, just as important to say, how much of this can I withdraw? We see that people are living longer, and Marlon, I know you'll touch on that as well, but especially our professional clients live longer. And we help them to not withdraw too much money out of their pension so that they will eventually run out. And then the second one there that we that we say is also something that we do here is, is leaving a legacy. For some people, it's very important to leave a legacy and to say, I want my kids to remember me by this. If it's anything like our family, we say, we've put you through university, I've paid for your school. If you inherit something, then you could consider yourself lucky. So different things are important for different families and for different people. Post retirement planning looks at that and we help a client to fulfill those wishes that they have. Yes, I think of you as, I mean, our wish for, for all our clients, uh, and in particular for our members, is that this phase of your life, you're able to really enjoy your golden years, that you get the opportunity to really reap the harvest which you've been sown. You know, statistically, Vainat already alluded to it that. Professionals outlive non-professionals, and they do so significantly. This means that your retirement planning is absolutely critical. It's crucial because you will live longer. You will have more years of living post-retirement than a non-professional. And of course, you only get one chance to get this right. And it, you know, it starts with that very first job. I think we have to remember, like our mutual always says, that you pay yourself first. And of course, you spend later. This is also the time when we start asking really serious questions about what's going to happen to all of our stuff when we're gone. You now your beach house, your home, your jewelry, the art, other collectibles, etc. We have to ensure that you have enough risk cover in place, or in the absence thereof, sufficient cash in the bank to provide the liquidity needed to wind up your estate. And of course, now, all of this starts with a plan, a plan that is based on your individual goals and your individual objectives, on what is important to you. Yeah, and Marlon, that just uh, helps us to come to this final point that we're going to make today, and it ties in with the very first thing we said, is to say life is about much more than money. And when you're doing financial planning, also ask your advisor to guide you through this so that you can decide what is the type of life that you want to live. What is it that will give meaning to your life? Write down smart goals. What is it that you want to accomplish for each one of those parts in the circle for one, three, five, for 10 years? And what is it that will give you a fulfilled and happy life? At the end of the day, our money is not just about money. I, I'm very passionate about that, but money is that enabler that will help you to reach those goals. So make sure that when you're doing your financial planning, you look at all of that, set goals, have a financial plan to get there. Because that way we can live a happy, purposeful and fulfilled life. Amen. So uh, thanks, thanks uh, speakers, thanks Annika, thanks Vainant. Um, uh, I think the presentation, the formal part is not done. Uh, we're going to move to our Q&A session. 
Uh, but before we do that, interestingly enough, it's almost an even split. I'm just I'm looking at our poll now, you know, the last poll that we have, which speaks to retirement. And uh, we, we have roughly an even split. Um, so 32% of our viewers are saying, yes, they have, have sufficient money or finances saved to live their best lives at retirement. And that's fantastic. It's way higher, higher than the national average. I think the national average is somewhere around 6%. Uh, so that's awesome. And then, of course, 32% of our viewers are saying that uh, they're really not sure. Uh, lastly, 35% of our viewers are saying that the retirement actually worries them and that they need help. And viewers, we, we don't want you to you guys to stress too much later on when we, we send you our thank you email. We'll give you an opportunity to speak to someone if you do not have a financial advisor that could possibly help you. So at this point, we're going to turn to our audience. And I've, I've seen there's, there's a couple of questions that have already been lined up for us. Um, the first question, and I'm thinking this one we're going to have to fire off to you, Annika. The mm -hmm. first question is from Bulelwa Jafta. And Jafta, Bulelwa wants to know, what happens to a trust when the founder of the trust dies? Yeah, thank you, Marlon. Um, also a very good question from our audience. Um, Remember, trust is um, the trust deed governs what happens to a trust. So the founder dying doesn't impact the continuity of a trust. That's the short version of that. But it is very important to always look at your trust and what is the in, a tr a trust is a contractual agreement. So in the trust, it gives us guidance who and when and what happens and when does the trust terminate and how does the trust mm -hmm. carry on with capital and income income beneficiaries. But the founder of the trust dying doesn't influence the continuity of the trust. Absolutely, Annika. And I think, you know, this is alluding to what you said earlier on around perpetual succession. That's exactly for this point, that we would create a trust. We spoke about inter vivos trust. These are the trusts that are created during the lifetime of, um, of course, the, uh, um, the donor or the set law. I think that's what we call the, the technical term. So, yes, the trust deed, uh, um, uh, Balewa, will determine how trusteeship will change on the death of the founder. So I'm just going back to my list, now, and uh, we hope that we answered your question, uh, uh, Balewa. Uh, the following question is from B B Bernard Olafir. And Avainant, I think this is this is probably one way we will need you to get involved with. So the question from, B from, from Bernard is, what percentage is a safe withdrawal rate from your living annuity at retirement? So, Marlon, the guidance that we give is to say no more than 4,000 Rand per month for every 1 million that, that you have on investment. So that comes up to about a 4.8% um, annual withdrawal rate. Now, there's people who say you can't live on that and it's not realistic. And so if you want to not eat into your capital and make sure that you sustain that, then try and keep it under 5%. So there's a lot of things that you need to take into consideration. You have to ask yourself, would you want some capital to go on an overseas holiday? Do you have sufficient capital um, to have like an emergency fund as we spoke about? So there's a lot of things that you need to take into consideration and therefore I would strongly advise you to make sure that you sit down with a financial planner that can do proper cash flow calculations, that can show you every year what the effect will be of these withdrawals that you make. But if you want a rule of thumb, a safe ballpark figure, mm -hmm. then remember this, 4,000 Rand for every million Rand that you have on investment, that is a safe, and then you can escalate it every year with inflation and still not um, eat into your capital. Absolutely, I have to agree. You know, I mean, uh, there's this principle that, uh, you know, we want, to, we want to outlive our money, not to have our, our money sort of dying before we die. So, I mean, a safe drawdown rate will be 4 to 5%. And in that way, of course, there's assumptions that we're getting a specific rate of return. And if that difference, the delta between the rate of return that you're getting and how much money you're using is big enough, it means effectively that money will carry on for forever. And uh, uh, it will become a valuable tool. And I think not just in your life while you're alive, but I mean, it becomes a gift that you can take and you can give your children. And of course, also we have the benefits of it um, not being a state duty. But... So thanks for that. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next question. I see I have uh, another question. And I think this one is again uh, uh, aimed at you, Annika. JC Kroon here wants to know, can an heir 
in the world sign as a witness <laughs> thank you marlin um the the <laughs> The signing of the wills are very important. Um, as a rule, that your your beneficiaries should not sign as witnesses in the will. Your beneficiaries or their spouses should not sign as a witness in the will. It can a bit get a bit more technical than that, but normally, mm. if you do sign as a witness, you are disinheriting yourself from the estate so be careful we normally say that you have to get two independent witnesses and, and these witnesses does not need to know the content of the will they do to, uh, to confirm that this is the testator or testatrix or both signing the will okay awesome um so the next one and i think i'm gonna fire this back at you now uh, so Anakis, don't go away uh, the next one is from Pomeza Hugo, and Pomeza wants to know, very important question, what's the difference between guardians and executors in a will? Uh, uh, what are each of those people or individuals, what are their responsibilities? Thank you for that question, Pumizu. Um, your guardians appointed. Um, so the first point I just want to mention, a guardian appointed is in terms of the minor children, who is a legal person who will act on behalf of the minor children when legal guardians are not there anymore. You cannot replace a natural guardian though. So if husband and wife are divorced, your husband or your wife still remains the guardian. But if no husband or wife is or um, mother and father is alive, a guardian is appointed to act as the legal guardian um, of the minor children and decision making of the minor children. Executors is the person who will deal with your estate and administer your estate according to your wishes um, in terms of your will as well as according to the Estate Administration Act. So executor needs to understand everything about the laws of taxes, the Administration Act, and how and what to do in order to finalize the estate. So the executor deals with the estate, finalize the estate, deals with your taxes, where the guardian will continue to look after the interests of minor children. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Pabalba. Um, we've got another question, and I, I really want to, uh, uh, I'm going to fire this off to you. So uh, this one, uh, the next question comes from, from Clive Valentine. Uh, Clive wants to know, should one provide uh, business assurance or succession? If you're a sole proprietor, I think this is a good question, Vayner. Yes, Marlon. So obviously, there needs to be planning to say what happens to to um, this business when you when you pass away. So, what is the succession plan? So, it's something that doesn't always have to be solved by business assurance or with life cover, but there should be a plan in place because. And and remember, if you're a sole proprietor, your business passes away with you. It doesn't. It doesn't continue. But you have a client base. You have assets in that business. You have some sort of capital value. So it is well worth sitting down with a financial advisor to say, what happens to all of this when I pass away? Is there somebody that wants to buy it? And the solution that we often find um, for sole proprietors who wants to have a partner who buys out their business is to rather convert it to a company, for instance, and give a 1% share to somebody else. Then we can put a proper buy and sell uh, agreement in place. And then there's a lot of other benefits that a company holds. But a sole proprietor also has benefits. So it's not something that should be done without the help of a professional. So there are instances where you can do that, depending on what type of company it is and what you want to happen with that. Um, and, and I would especially encourage that if it's a company that's built up a big asset base or a big client base. Okay, awesome. Um, Vainat, yes, absolutely. And, and I think in practice, you know, one thing that we, we find quite often um, is that I see Clive as an attorney. He's an attorney in, in, in practice. And uh, Clive, what we find quite often is that, uh, uh, of course, for this to work, you have to have employees inside of your practice. So over time, of course, there's a bit of skill transfer that happens. And if, you, if you've if you got the, the luxury, and if you don't, you, you need to, to, to please find one, of having an attorney working inside of your, your practice, you can do what we call a one-sided buy and sell. 
Uh, one-sided buy and sell, of course, there's implications. It's it's a, it's a, the implications of which is that the state duty benefits that's normally linked to a normal buy and sell, you're not necessarily going to enjoy. But at least you'll be able to ensure that the consideration that you get for your practice is representative of the value of that practice. Um, so absolutely, yes, we can protect your practice, uh, but I do agree 100% with Vayner that perhaps the sole prop while it has a lot of advantages, it's not always the best uh, um, a business entity form to follow. I'm just looking at the other questions and I'm conscious of time. Uh, there's another good one over here that I'm quite liking. Uh, so, 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 Tina Bambini um, wants to know, and this is like the second last question I'm going to take. And I think this is again fired at you, uh, um, Annika. So, I think the question is around the difference of having your will with the attorney versus the bank or other. She wants to know, what is the safest to entrust one's will to? And I don't think there's such a thing as a safe thing, you know, but there are indeed differences. Annika? Hmm. Marlon, I must be very careful to say uh, um, who you should entrust your will to um, without pump, um, saying PPS. But it is very important mm -hmm. that when you appoint an executor of your estate, that that person does have the knowledge um, in terms of the legal side to deal with an administration of the estate. We often then, um, uh, more than often, want to appoint individuals as executors. So I'm going to answer it in this way, that the master or you are allowed in terms of uh, law of succession to appoint any person to be your executor. However, in terms of the master's directive, a person who is appointed as your executor must have the understanding of the law. And the master is not there to help you or to tell you how to administer an estate. Therefore, you have to go to a person who are able or a company who are able to do that. And, and that is, you know, to, so you must have peace of mind that who you entrust your executorship with will be there for you when you're not there. Um, that's the more important part for me to say that who do I trust? Um, whether that is um, the banks or attorneys, who is the person that you feel comfortable in doing that? Absolutely. So, guys, we're running out of time, and I'm going to quickly, there's two more questions that I'm going to address, but I'm just not going to answer it myself. Uh, Kenny, Kenny is, uh, is a supporting intermediary. Welcome, Kenny. Thank you for your question. So, Kenny wants to know, he's a financial advisor, and what part of PPS does fiduciary services fall under? In other words, which PPS consultant do I talk to? Uh, uh, Risco Investments. Now, the short answer, Kenny, is that PPS Fiduciary is a standalone business unit. Um, so you can go to our website, you'll find the Fiduciary link, and of course you'll get access to all our, our, our Fiduciary specialists. But I think your quickest route to market and probably the best strategy for you to follow will be to speak to your life specialist and have a word with them around who exactly is the servicing fiduciary specialist for that particular region. Uh, then, then there's another good question, and I think I'm going to handle this one. Uh, Clive, I see, is quite busy, quite enjoying uh, um, uh, um, Clive's questions. Clive, once again, wants to know, and he wants to speak to you, Annika. And uh, so the question is, can we assist with a query regarding exchange control and payment of an inheritance to a beneficiary resident overseas? So this is a highly technical specialist field, Kenny, uh, uh, Clive at least. And between the competencies that we have inside of PPA specialist support services and fiduciary, absolutely. Drop us a mail. Members, I've just put up uh, uh, um, our contact details. I see this being a mistake because apparently uh, the email address of PPA fiduciary services is specialist support, which is fantastic for us. Not so good for PPA specialist, uh, at least fiduciary services. But either one. Uh, you use either one of them. And if you have a specific incident, uh, incident that you want us to get involved in, please fire off. And of course, we'll ensure that we deploy the best specialist to, to service your clients. Now, members, we, we've, we've, we've run out of time, unfortunately. And I think, you know, in, in, in closing, as an industry, I think we've worked tirelessly to enhance our professionalism. And I think, you know, the days of you know, the age old sort of insurance salesman, it's quickly drawing to a close. 
we long move past the whole, okay, so how much have you got approached to insurance and investments? I mean, so well, affordability is paramount. It is not the starting point of your plan. The starting point is identifying what your goals and what your objectives are. Then, of course, we work it back to a solution. So we should always start with the end in mind. Our members' lives are, are not static. You know, they're constantly evolving. It's constantly changing. So it's essential that the financial, your financial planning is not a once-off event. The plan itself must be flexible and dynamic, and it must reflect the evolutionary nature of the modern professional. And just like your financial plan, PPS2 has evolved. We evolved into a full suite financial services provider, which offers life and short-term insurance, investment management, medical aid, and fiduciary services. So please speak to your financial advisor or broker to assist you in harnessing the full power of profit share and the benefits of our ethos of mutuality as you plot a course to living your best life. We'll be mailing you shortly a, a, a short questionnaire. Please complete it. Your feedback is critical in ensuring that we deliver high quality content. Please also join us next week for the last webinar in the series, which we're entitling Asset Protection in Times of Uncertainty. Please look out for the banners, emailers, and social media, which will be flighting later today. And we understand that as professionals, your time is a commodity and that you have it in short supply. And we feel extremely privileged that you decided to spend your time with us. We hope that you found the session useful and informative. And thank you once again for joining us. Stay safe, stay blessed. And remember, those who fail to plan, plan to fail. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bolin.